The Albertine Rift Valley that lies at the parallels of Uganda and DR Congo is a jewel in the crown of the Great Western Rift Valley which stretches from the northern tip of Lake Albert in Uganda to the southern tip of Lake Tanganyika at the Rwanda-Tanzania border. It is one of the most ecologically sensitive and biodiverse regions on the continent. The resplendent Matchstone Falls National Park to the northwest, together with the Bugungu and Karuma Wildlife Reserves, which form the Matchstone Falls Conservation Area, covering an expanse of 3,893 square kilometers, lie within this axis. The conservation area is home to some 144 mammal species, 566 bird species, 51 reptiles, 28 amphibians, and more than 758 known plant species. Droves of tourists from near and far come here to glimpse the idyllic breathtaking scenery as the sunrise or sunset tour pokes the earth. It is inside the park that the mighty River Nile gushes into Lake Albert en route to the sand-colored landscape in Egypt to the Mediterranean Sea. Also situated inside the park is Matchland Falls, where the government in 2019 teased plans to construct a 360 megawatts hydroelectric dam at the adjacent Huru Falls, a move that elicited widespread criticism. Yet again, conservation, aficionados and anti-fossil fuel kicked up another storm over the ongoing construction of oil infrastructure inside the park. A lot has been said and written about Uganda's oil project since exploration and appraisal from around 2012 when he Anglo-Irish world cutter Talo Oil and Total EP, now Total Energies, intensified, among others, seismic surveys. But since February 1st, when government and the joint ventures, Total Energies, Sinoc, Yunok and TPDC announced final investment decision for the $10 billion oil project, what started as a conservation campaign has turned into fierce opposition. International media is a wash of fears, concerns and environmental risks, real and perceived. Some have even inferred that the country is on a path to self-destruction with oil. There is a legitimate fear that our activity will have an impact on biodiversity and it's up to us to transform this legitimate fear this, uh, that we will, we will constitute a threat and that we have to transform that and demonstrate it's, uh, it's an opportunity. And with our presence on ground, and uh, we will be able to positively contribute. You know that this is not the first time that oil and gas activities are going to be taking place in Maxion Falls National Park. Of the about 120 wells that have been drilled in the country so far, most of these wells have actually been drilled within the environments that you describe. And for a number of these, uh, for a number of these uh, sites, if you go in Maxion Falls National Park, with the exception now of the new road that is being constructed there for the new well pads, you will not find any evidence of previous oil and gas activities within this area. So we have proved so far that oil and gas activities can coexist with other sectors like conservation, uh, tourism. And for me, what worries me about Uganda and, and, and this uh, um, oil resource that we're going to explore is that, unfortunately, if we look at the precedents, and I, I'm, I'm coming from uh, having studied environmental science, and I understand you know, you know, that uh, environmental impact assessments have been, um, have been done and so on. But if we look at the track record of regions that have recently explored oil, the story has never been an, a good story. Uh, we have had significant oil spills, communities have been vulnerable, and, and a lot of those challenges are related with all other secondary factors, lack of capacity, governance issues, and, and, and some of that. So the point I'm trying to drive is that, yes, Uganda has um, uh, this opportunity 
But we have to be cautiously in how we approach this issue. Last month, Total Energies, which operates the Tilenga project, part of which lies within the conservation area in Nyoa and Belisa district, launched an ambitious biodiversity program, an initiative for protecting and conserving biodiversity in and around the conservation area. The program encompasses four pillars. Reducing human pressures and strengthening the ecological resilience of the park, implementing conservation and restoration measures for forests and their connectivity, protecting and maintaining the connectivity of habitants in the savannah and in the proximity of the Bugungu Natural Reserve, and working with the host community to manage and restore wetlands along the southern bank of Lake Albat. We aim to achieve this by working together in partnership with communities, with mandated institutions, and also with conservation, society, conservation organizations as well as civil society. So what sort of activities do we plan to do under this program? So the program involves designing and implementing a, a range of interventions that will be done in partnership with the authorities, conservation actors that are present in the landscape and community-based organizations. Prior, the French oil company undertook the requisite environmental, social and impact assessment studies for operations in the conservation area, which report was submitted to the National Environmental Management Authority in June 2018, which was reviewed by the relevant government agencies and followed by the mandatory public hearings to input comments from the public. This culminated in NEMA issuing a certificate of clearance in April 2019. NEMA says everything has been looked at holistically. So I think Uganda has been deliberate and has been careful. And so uh, there is all the assurance to the world and to the citizens that we have capacity to monitor and regulate the oil and gas industry. However, all endeavors seem far from comforting. The section of NGOs insists that the environmental and social management plans are inadequate and proper guidelines were not followed. Ugandan-born, South Africa-based water and climate change consultant and Ms. Mao, who lectures at the University of Cape Town, told NTV that it is hard to entrust big things with a system that has failed to deal with basic things. We basically don't have the basic, you know, ingredients in place to make this work for us, you know. And I know it can sound, you know, optimistic that, you know, this is something new, it's going to be a game changer and, 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 and so on. But unfortunately, we have to learn from history. We have to learn from other developing countries how, I mean, if you look at Nigeria and the, the, the you know, the, the Niger Delta, you know, Nigeria has got like huge billion years that have come out of the oil and gas. But if you go to those locations, if you hear the stories of people who have been impacted because of this oil exploration, you know, your default position is going to be no, because there is no precedent that has been set by the countries that have got the same economic profile like Uganda, that this has actually worked and has transformed their societies. He, however, says oil and conservation is a delicate balance. Look at your typical tourist, a tourist who wants to come uh, from wherever, to, from New York, from, from London, from Copenhagen, to come to visit Uganda, they are most the key thing that drives them there is that they're going to go into wilderness, they're going to enjoy clean air, they're going to enjoy the, you know, the sounds of nature, the pristine conditions, and so on. My belief and is, is that, you know, it will negatively impact tourism. And whether they will harmoniously coexist, my honest, honest, feedback to you is that I don't think it, it's going to work. Um, we're going to have uh, trade-offs. The poor image of the government internationally, the bad governance, clientele patronage politics, 
human rights violations NEMIT has sought more fuel to the campaign against the $10 billion project. Carbon emissions from both drilling and the proposed East African crude oil pipeline has been invoked to the equation on backdrop of the recently released Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, which detailed that climate crisis as unequivocally damning. It's clearly with oil and gas production uh, and transportation through the AirCorp, there are going to be emissions associated with its production and transportation. But then, what emissions can be re removed from Uganda's emissions by doing that now? If you look at the overall emissions, currently we import all our fuel products into the country by road. So I would want someone to come up with an estimate or a computation of how much in terms of emissions is associated with those many hundreds of trucks that come from Mombasa every day bringing uh, fuel imports into the country. Because once we start our own production, those are going to be eliminated. A group of 13 local NGOs on June 30th claimed that Uganda's oil activities will produce over 34.3 million metric tons of carbon, equal to nine coal-fired power plants. The NGOs, however, did not detail how they arrived at their computation. Since 2020, a section of NGOs have been prodding international financing institutions to invoke their new fossil fuels financing policies that set out stringent conditions for lending to fossil fuel projects, including requiring total energies and government to commit to minimizing or reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Other NGOs, local and international, have been insistent that the project stops inundating financial institutions with letters not to finance it. Joseph Kobsheshe, the Director for Environment, Health, Safety and Security Management at the Petroleum Authority, the oil sector regulator says there is more than meets the eye in some of the NGOs' agenda. There are many factors. The oil industry, first of all, as you know, uh, there is a, a level of geopolitics involved in the oil industry. That could be one factor. Uh, economic aggression, uh, that can't be ruled out. But also lack of information and misinformation. I have seen some of these people arguing against uh, the IACOP. Some of them do not even, are not even able to locate where Uganda is on the <laughs> world map. He said oil and conservation have coexisted for the last decade during the exploration and appraisal phase. From the onset, when oil and gas was commercially dis uh, confirmed in Uganda in 2006, the process then that started with the setting up of the oil and gas policy, the laws and the regulations, they took cognizant of all these pristine environments and made sure commitments that Uganda's oil and gas sector is developed in a manner that ensures coexistence uh, with all these other important uh, economic subsectors. Between 2005 and 2015, according to the Ministry of Water and Environment's Climate Change Department, Uganda's carbon emissions from 53 metric tons to 90 metric tons, the upsurge attributed to agriculture, forestry and land usage. If you look at the estimates that we have from the oil and gas sector of between 20 to 30, 35 uh, kilograms of CO2 emissions per barrel, that would equate to a significantly lower even increase per annum compared to what we already have. The raging climate change debate has invigorated discussion on the branch line, the gap in the financial world being between richer developed countries and poorer developing countries, commonly known as the North-South Divide. Some pundits describe as unfair the notion to completely halt new oil projects in the poorer South, in Africa and Latin America for the sake of avoiding mistakes committed by North, 
that is, developed countries during the 1960s, 70s and 80s, which partly contributed to the current climate disaster manifested through rising water levels, erratic forest fires, erratic weather and fast-melting glacier in the polar zones. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Sixth Assessment Report, published in February, warned that the world is set to reach the 1.5 degree C level within the next two decades and said that only the most drastic cuts in carbon emissions from now would help prevent an environmental disaster. The most important thing that we need to be quite cognizant of about is that these are very complex issues. Um, they, they are not an either or. Uh, and the solutions oftentimes require a lot of, you know, things to be to be looked at from a various perspective. So the reality is that we're having these extreme events, flooding and, you know, drought and so on is real. That's one. The second is that the develop, developing country is not responsible for the tragedy that we're facing. Okay. And so what that means is that the developed world has to take some responsibility in terms of making sure that the developing countries like Uganda, who are going to be most impacted by the impact of climate change, actually have the adaptive capacity to be able to respond more effectively. Okay? Uh, in this war, <laughs> there is no uh, one size fits all approach. And for me, that is uh, the problem in this whole approach that you have uh, people sitting somewhere without looking at the specific needs of specific countries, especially the developing world and Africa in particular, and designing a case that is applicable. Because our biggest emissions uh, contributions are not from uh, fossil fuel utilization. We still have energy poverty, as I mentioned. Uh, our challenges, our opportunities, they lie. This is, these are mainly agriculture-based countries, so land use, agriculture, this is where we need to uh, focus. And then, in line with the industrialization plans, I, I don't think we will we, we'll have to do more, yes, in energy efficiency, but clearly in certain areas. There are certain areas where it is inevitable that as a country we have good opportunities to reduce, but there are also areas, and as energy is one of them, where you can be sure that the contributions from the energy sector will uh, have to rise. Overall, we still maintain an opportunity for a net reduction. Inside the Matson Falls National Park, a narrow, dirty path veers off at Pakuba Junction of the main Tanji Pakwach Road into the wilderness where it's next to the Jobri 5, one of the 10 well pads inside the park. Construction works to establish support infrastructure to extract oil are in overdrive inside an encircled campsite. Atop any of the large soil mounds, one cannot miss the sight of especially antelopes, warthogs and buffaloes feeding. The list of rules applied here is long. No hooting, no PPE with high sensitive colors, speed limit ranges between 10 to 20 km per hour via the pathway to the camp, no overtaking, minimization of light and noise and car reversing is emphasized, Tourists and animals have the right of way and all off-site movements require guidance of a game ranger. The order of hierarchy to tell energies officials gamely emphasize is environment, wildlife, tourism and the oil project. But does it mean tourism and conservation can coexist? Coexistence by, natural, by virtue of the decisions of government. <laughs> which is they, they must coexist. It is a must. But the issue we should look for, can it be in a bit of harmony? It is a harmony, harmony which we look for. Uh, we developed some tool to use to establish the opinions of the tourists on the ongoing activities of oil and gas during the exploration and appraisal phase. 
what we discovered was that some of the visitors did not even know that there was an activity going on. They said, so you mean there is even oil extraction going on? And yet it was going on. What does that mean? It meant that we, the involved stakeholders, agreed on strategies which helped the two uh, economic activities to coexist. Some researchers have painted a grim picture during parallels to the beleaguered Niger Delta and pointing to adverse interruption to the ecosystem which will deal blow to the tourism sector the highest foreign exchange earner of $1.6 billion that is about 5.6 trillion shillings between 2018 and 2019 before COVID-19 appended life as we know it. The oil industry has lived in this Uganda now for quite a time. And we have known the phases coming and following each other. And so, engagements have been going on. There is, uh, honestly, little we can say that, you know, we are caught off guard because of the hardness. We have been knowing these things. Yes, only level of flexibility in engagements or in dialogue, levels of different stakeholders. One saying, no, this one cannot happen, this, no, this can happen. But if we all agree with some levels of flexibilities, we shall coexist and the tourism will go on and the oil development will go on, in, at least in my opinion. These projects have undergone a very rigorous and robust environmental screening, environmental impact assessment, the designs that have been undertaken. Uh, have taken care of this, minimizing as much as possible the footprint of the, of the projects. As you are aware, we are going to have only 10 well pads within Maxion Falls National Park. All the other facilities are outside the park. Even the design of these well pads has been done, is going to be undertaken in such a manner that we minimize the visual, the noise, vibration impact of this area so that after construction and during the uh, production uh, phase, the, there will be minimal uh, and the significant impacts within uh, uh, these very important and sensitive uh, areas. I think that if we choose the oil route, we are going to actually lose out. Um, and I know that oil sounds like a quick, easy, easy win. But if you look at Uganda's natural resources, if you look at how well endowed we are with the beautiful weather, natural um, fat, fertile soils, so Uganda has all the resources to develop to become a middle-income country, dare I say, you know? But what we need to be cautious about is quick, short wins. As a country, and I want to look at us as a country, not even institution, we have had uh, a reasonably good time to prepare for this sector since the first commercial discovery was made in 2006. This is 2022. How many years are those? Uh, 17 years in between. So all these years have been uh, used to prepare well on how this industry can be governed, on how this industry can be regulated. The fears and concerns, both risks and perceived, can be easily written off. But the key question is, how can a government that has failed to act on basic things such as encroachment of swamps, forests or even basic order in the city ensure that the oil conservation trade-offs are not adverse? Only time will tell.